Good evening. I'm Joan Gelfand, and I'm the host of Special Edition of the San Francisco Open Mic Poetry Podcast TV Show from the Clarion Music Center in San Francisco. My guest tonight is Meryl Natchez, and we're very excited to have her because Meryl just has a new book out with Hit and Run Press, Poems from the Stray Dog Cafe. We're going to hear some work from there. And uh, Meryl's uh, translations uh, are in this book and a previous book, which we'll also talk about, that came out earlier uh, in 2000. And her own book, Jade Suit, uh, came out in 2001. Her poems have appeared nationally, and um, you're obviously bilingual. Well, I wouldn't say bilingual, but I'm fluent enough to work on other languages, especially Slavic languages. Okay, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about your previous books before we get into the Stray Dog Cafe. Well, the first book that I worked on was a, a co-translation with the publisher of this book, uh, Larry Rafferty, and it was the poems of a, a man called Tadeusz Borowski, a Polish poet who was in the resistance in Poland, wound up in Auschwitz and Dachau, and he memorized his poems, other prisoners memorized his poems, and after the war they were collected. And we first heard about him through his book, This Way for the Gas, ladies and gentlemen, with an introduction by Philip Roth. It's an amazing book of stories. And his poems had never been translated, and so we worked with another man, uh, Tadeusz Pioro, who is Polish, and uh, he would do the literals. And I studied Polish for about eight months. It's very similar to Russian, and I know Russian. And we would get together, each of us would do a translation, and we'd get together and put them together and do the best that we could. And uh, that's still the only translation of his work into English. So he made it out of the camps with his own work. He hmm. did make it out of the camps, but unfortunately he committed suicide in the 50s. He was very disillusioned. He had thought that communism was really going to be the answer and kind of became a communist hack, really, and then couldn't stand it. Couldn't stand that there was no, no real change, that they'd all suffered so much and nothing changed. Tragic. It's tragic. Tragic. And these poems' life, lives were extremely tragic too. It doesn't pay to be a Slav. <laughs> no, that's a rough, rough calling, and poetry is a rough calling as well. Um, tell us a little bit how you came to this particular uh, translation and this cafe. It's so fascinating. You were telling me that the cafe still exists yeah. and you visited it. The Stray Dog Cafe actually exists in St. Petersburg and it was the gathering place for all kinds of poets, artists, musicians. It was sort of like Cafe Trieste in San Francisco. Wonderful. And it, um, it existed in the early 1900s and this group of poets, Akhmatova, Mandelstam, and Gumilev, came there and they formed in the, in the early 1900s, they formed what they called the Acmeist group of poetry. And it was in a reaction against Russian symbolist poetry, which was very, very much like um, Longfellow and Wordsworth were in English. Mm -hmm. Well, not that they aren't exactly the same, but very, very much mannered and very flowery. And they, they felt the word was everything and they wanted simplicity, very much like the Imagists in Paris. And uh, they formed a, a magazine called Apollon, and they started publishing work. And unfortunately, it was in the early 1900s. Very soon, there were the Russian Revolution, the First World War, the Second World War, Stalin. And um, the only one to survive all of that was Akhmatova. But she was under house arrest for 20 years. None of her work was published. She was forced to write odes to Stalin to get her son out of prison and her second husband out of prison. Gumilev, her first husband, was executed. And Mandelstam wrote a poem about Stalin that got basically got him killed. So yeah, we'll read that today. OK, why don't we hear one, at least one poem first, and then sure. we'll talk a little bit more about their histories. Um, well, one of the reasons I think this, this book is so relevant is uh, this poem is from 1919. So it's the First World War. It's just after the Russian Revolution. And here's a, a little poem by Akhmatova, which I feel like could be written today. Why is this age worse than what came before? 
Is it because in a stupor of grief and dread, we've touched the blackest wounds with our own hands, unable to heal them? In the west, the earthly light still glows. The roofs of the city burn with its radiance. But here, white crosses mark the houses, calling the ravens, and the ravens are flying in. So there's this sense of dread and terror and despair that permeates a lot of her work, starting in the late part of the, the teens. Her early work was pretty frivolous and uh, romantic, if you'd like to hear a sample definitely, of that. Definitely, definitely. Uh, very, very different. This is 1911. My helpless heart grew cold, although my steps were light. The glove meant for my left hand wound up on my right. There seemed so many stairs, but my feet touched only three. Though the maples whispered, come and die with me, I was tricked by my aching, my fickle, my spiteful fate. So I answered, darling, yes, we'll both depart. The song of our last meeting, the house is dark and grim, and the bedroom candles burning their indifferent yellow flame. So it was very romantic, very sweet. She was in love with Gumilev. They both wrote poems to each other. It was a completely different tone than her work took on later. And where did she end up? Did she end up leaving the leaving Russia? No, she was offered the chance to leave Russia, but she felt that she couldn't exist anywhere else. And so uh, she was in a very tiny, like railroad apartment in St. Petersburg, which I got to see. It's now the Akhmatova Museum. It's like a little, you know, narrow four-room apartment looking out over a courtyard. And that was basically where she lived for the 20 years that she was out of favor with Stalin. And she actually wrote a poem about why she wouldn't leave. It's called Lot's Wife. And it's, it's lovely. This is 1924. Lot's Wife. God's luminous messenger, larger than life, led the one righteous man along the Black Mountain. But regret cried out to his wife, it's not too late. You can still catch a glimpse of Sodom, the red rooftops of home, the square where you sang, the yard where you spun, the tall house its windows abandoned, the house where your sons and daughters were born. She looked back. A sudden arc of pain stripped her eyes of sight, fused her feet to the ground. Her flesh became transparent salt. Who will mourn this nameless woman? She seems the least of all we lack. Yet I, for one, will never forget how she gave her life for one look back. So she refused to leave. Um, and her son was there, her second husband was there, and she was there. And she died, she lived, she outlived Stalin. She died in 1966, and she actually got to experience a kind of rebirth and fame in the very last years of her life. Yes, I've, I've read a bit about her. Um, how about hearing one of the, one of the other well, poets? Mandelstam was the person who I was first drawn to. Uh, here's a little photo of him. Handsome guy. Handsome guy. Um, he was... Uh, just a really powerful young poet, and he wrote very spiritual poems. Here's an example. Agonizing and vague, your image eludes me in the mist. Oh, Lord, I cried out by mistake, not having meant at all to say it. Like an enormous bird, God's name flew forth from my chest. Before me, thick mist swirls, a vacant cage gapes from behind. That's very typical of his early work. It's very soulful and very searching. And then um, here's one he wrote to Anna Akhmatova. Bees get used to the beekeeper. That's just the nature of things. But my god, what a temper. 20 years of Akhmatova's stings. Wow. And you notice a lot of these poems, there is some rhyme. And that's because Russian itself is a language that is absolutely made for rhyme. It, every verb conjugates, every noun declines. So everything rhymes. The endings are the same. It's very hard to translate for that reason, because if you try to translate that in English, it sounds stiff. But I did try to keep at least some of the flavor of the rhyme. And if you'd like, I'd, I'll read you the poem that got it led to Mandelstam being exiled first and then sent to Siberia on the train he died. 
And um, he recited this poem at a literary gathering. And the rumor, I mean, someone informed on him. That's what happened. He recited, he never wrote it down. It was too dangerous to have around, but he recited it. I guess he couldn't, he couldn't resist. <laughs> and uh, it wound up, this was 1933. He died in 1937. He was exiled for two years to a remote region, then was pardoned, then was arrested again and sent to Siberia. So this is, it wasn't titled, but I titled it Stalin Epigram. We live but cannot feel the earth, and if we speak, we can't be heard. But wherever you hear a half conversation, they talk of that backwoods lout in the Kremlin. Ten fat fingers like greasy worms. Each of his words weighs 50 pounds. His mustache bristles in cockroach laughter, and his polished jackboots glitter. His gang surrounds him, a spineless crew, half men who do what he tells them to. Some growl, some whimper, some yowl and hiss, but he alone rages and bangs his fist. He forges decrees like horseshoes. They fly at groin, forehead, eyebrow, eye, each execution sweet as a berry for th this broad-chested thug from Gory. You can understand why that might upset <laughs> the all-powerful leader of the country. And, um, and the, the wonderful thing about it in Russian that I tried to capture is it reads like a little nursery rhyme. It's <laughs> anapestic. It goes, ta 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 You know, it's just, and therefore it's catchy and easy to remember, and people remembered it. And uh, so that was his undoing. And Gumilev, um, I'm not going to read any of his work because actually I think it's the least interesting in English. It's very, it's very, very mannered and hard to um, to grasp. But um, what I would like to do, if you are up for it, is is read a poem of Akhmatova's from the end, of very end of of this period, 1940, just before she is um, she is placed under house arrest. And um, I'd like to do it in Russian and in English. It's oh, very lovely. short. So you lovely. could hear kind of the crunchiness of the Russian as well as the English translation. So should I do it in Russian first? Sure. OK. No ya prejdu prejdayu vas, što ya živu v potlesledni ras, ni laščokoj, ni klonim, ni trosnikom in jivjazdoj, ni rodnokova juvadoj. Ya buru ya ludes muschac, i sni chujia navischac, neutalonem stonem. Ah, but I am warning you, this life's the last I'm living through. Not as a swallow, as a poplar, or a poplar, not as a reed or a star. I won't return, not as water from a well or a bell's hollow song. I won't return to trouble men or visit strangers' dreams again with my unquenchable lament. Hmm, beautiful. Yeah, so you can see I fell in love with these poems. Yeah. And um, I actually first read them when I was um, a junior in high school. I took a summer course at Harvard, and um, I had had this really wonderful, earthy Russian teacher when I got to Harvard, I found out I had a Ukrainian accent, which is sort of like a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> and everybody else was just at a very different level than me. And I, but I found this volume of Mandelstam's poems in the stacks, and I was transported. And so I'd kind of been working on them for about 40 years. And then Bob Hass, Robert Hass, had a translation workshop, and I got to go and work on these. And that's really what, what led to this book. Beautiful, beautiful story. Um, any of your own work that you'd like to uh, call uh, up and read to us? Um, well, I could probably recite a yes. poem or two sure. for you if you sure. want. Um, so um, I wrote this poem. I had a bunch of poets over for a weekend, and you know we we're doing kind of writing, 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 and you know staying up late. And I came in the next morning and like. The kitchen was in chaos, right? Wine glasses everywhere and plates. And, 
And I realized I didn't mind at all just sitting down and, you know, getting down and cleaning it up. But I remembered how much I used to mind. And I wrote this poem called The Endless Chores Ode, which I'll recite for you. Um, Drifts of laundry spilled across the couch. No counter that doesn't work, need wiping. Sink stifled with dishes. Stove top covered in magma don't even open the oven door. The surprise of cat shit in the closet. Dust bunnies instead of lust. And even if I get it cleaned up, if I for one moment summon the energy and focus to get it all under control, as soon as I put the last glass on the shelf and go for a walk, it starts all over again. The sink full by the time I get back. And the ineffectual, repetitive nagging that goes with it so that I become the harridan, the hag of chores, need and need and need, the basso ostinato, the ambient drone of the ever undone. A mountain of sound I am stuck under, struggling for one uncluttered spot, my only escape, the wormhole to paid work. How many years was, I, was my path obscured by junk? When did I first stand at the sink, at peace with the suds and the crud? Maybe it was the day we made shortbread and cleaned up together, eating the buttery squares from the pan. Or the day that I heard the beat in the broom, Aretha pulsing through all the griefs and loss, the terrible, unpredictable phone calls, the relief of something to do, my stalwart, reliable companion, always available when nothing else was getting me through. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> Very much a, a woman's poem, yes. <laughs> yeah, um, it's not actually a typical poem for me. I, I tend to write short poems, but that one um, had a lot of, a lot of chores in it. <laughs> yes, um, well, wonderful, wonderful. Are we, um, uh, how's our time? Wrap, going. Okay. No, Would wrap you? it up. Okay, wrap it, wrap it up. Well, this was lovely, Joan. Thank you so much. A for, pleasure. For A having pleasure. Me. And um, to everyone who's here listening, your smiling, nodding faces are very helpful. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely. Mm.